Hi, my name is Atini Kestani Kabo. My name is Imabon Akan. My name is Mary Edoro. My name is Chidima Uzoma. My name is Gwa Lua Funke Ajose. This is our show. Okay. Hi, my name is Funsho Oliemi. I am a business executive, a creative director, and a circular fashion accelerator. I am the founder of Turban Tempest, Template, and Yika app. My first business I started in 2016. It came about because I hated the traditional gili, which is the traditional Nigerian head wrap. It's so uncomfortable. I absolutely hated it and I also didn't like the idea of blending in with everybody else. So what I used to do is I would, you know, I always wanted to stand out so I would always wear something else. If you give me a ghillie, I'll probably turn it into something completely different. And I also didn't like the idea that, you know, there were only limited styles of ghillies and everybody looked the same and my personality um, wasn't shining through at the occasions I attended. So that was how it came about. It came about because of a personal rebellion and me not wanting to look like everybody else and also the fact that I hated the fact that I had to be uncomfortable because I wanted to attend the party. Fast forward, I ended up designing for myself and I would attend parties and women would come up to me and say, we love what you're wearing, how do we get this, where do we get this? And then I thought, okay, you know, I can make it for you. And then before you knew it, I was telling 10 people, I can make one for you. And from 10 people, it grew to, let's say, 30 people. And I just found that I was making them. The problem came about when I realized that I was a lawyer with no fashion experience. And I was only able to turn things around, put things together and hand stitch them. So when the order started to become much more than I anticipated, I had to look for a tailor who knew what they were doing. The unfortunate thing about it is that at the time, there were no tailors that knew how to tie to, to make turbans. So I found myself going from place to place, looking for tailors, trying to explain what needed to be done, but a lot of people weren't interested. So I did what I know how to do best. I had to pray for a miracle. And that's when I realized that if I could learn to do something that I've never done before, then I can teach someone to do something that they've never done before. So what I did is I got an obyoma, which are those guys that, you know, uh, walk around with the sewing machines on their shoulders, clanking their scissors. And I literally got him to come into my compound and I started to speak to him challenge was that he didn't speak a word of English so my gate man at the time had to help me translate and what amazed me was his attitude he was like I can do it let's try let's do this and the two of us sat there for hours uh, I think we started at like 11 a.m. and finished at 4 p.m. by then we had made our first sewing machine stitched turban and that was how we began in my parents compound on the floor with an obioma Growing up, I always wanted to make sure that I managed my time. My mum was very hardworking and I noticed that she didn't have the opportunity to spend time with her family. And um, I resented the fact that she couldn't or she wasn't in ownership of her time. So growing up, I've always known that whatever it is I wanted to do, I had to be in control of my time. I didn't want to work for anybody for a long period of time. I wanted to make sure that when I have kids and when I have a family, I'm able to dedicate the time I want to to that and adjust my time and schedules accordingly. When I started Turban Tempest, as I said, it was just out of my own personal desire. So I was my niche. Women who wanted to stand out, women who wanted to make sure that when they dressed, their personality showed. When they went out, they didn't blend in with everybody else. Women who wanted to hold on to their sense of individualism. Uh, five years after that, I started Template, and it was born out of the same idea. My style is very, um, would I say, eclectic. I like to layer. I like to look baggy sometimes. I like to play around with textures, um, but I also like clean lines. My style is also very discreet. And I just realized that we didn't have that available in Nigeria. So once again, I built the brand based on, you know, 
appealing to women like myself who wanted to be discreet but also look stylish, fashionable and have added details to elevate their wardrobe. Being a woman, being young, um, sometimes it's very difficult to get the response you want out of people. Uh, so when I first started, I had a team of men. Everyone that worked with me were men. They, it wasn't intentional, it just happened to be the case that men at the time just you know, seemed to come around. But what I found happened is my age and the fact that I'm a female, I didn't get the response that I wanted to get from them. So there was a lot of uh, rebellion on the parts of them and they felt as though they couldn't answer to a female and a female couldn't speak to them in that manner and they you know the mentality of I have your type at home sometimes came into play and so what I had to do is I had to make sure that I was a little bit more assertive but at the same time I had to change the way in which I related with them. So I started to relate with them as brothers. And as I started to bring more females into the team, they were, uh, because of the precedent that I had laid down, they were able to receive them um, into the family and treat them with the same amount of respect. Uh, but apart from that, I wouldn't say that I've had as many issues as I did when I was working as a lawyer. So funding was an issue especially when I wanted to scale my brands. Banks and various other financial organizations don't seem to understand the idea behind the fashion business. And even though the fashion industry is one of the largest contributors uh, to the Nigerian economy, it's still one of the most underfunded sectors, industries in the Nigerian economy. And so a lot of my funding um, and a lot of my uh, ability to skill had to come from friends and family, most especially my parents. And I'm one of the people who are privileged enough to have that opportunity. Not everybody is, and so that's the reason why I believe that the fashion industry hasn't grown as much as our counterparts in you know, other parts of the world. Being an entrepreneur in Nigeria is extremely challenging. So a lot of the times on social media, in the store and everywhere else, people get to see the good side, but they don't get to see the tears. They don't get to see the willingness to just stop or just you know give up and pack up and as we say, japa to another country. Um, I can't lie and say I haven't been tempted to just stop and go back to a nine to five. I think everybody probably can relate to that but we just keep on going. Despite the rising cost in fuel, which affects the cost of production, despite the unavailability of raw materials, despite the rising cost of inflation, um, we keep going. But yeah, Nigeria is a very harsh environment to run a business at this time and we keep going despite the challenges. One of the rewarding parts um, that keep us going is actually our customers, um, our supporters, people who believe in the brand, people who have brought into the brand, people who continue um, despite price increases to purchase the products and one of the things that we are committed to doing is um, regardless of how hard or how difficult things get we're not going to compromise on quality. We're not going to say, uh, because things are more expensive now, we're gonna to start to um, produce with cheaper fabrics or we're gonna to start to, um, you know, sort of cut corners to ensure that the finished product is, is out. We've decided to just keep on going and, and we do believe things are going to get better. There's so much potential in Nigeria. There's so much talent in Nigeria and we just have to keep on going because things will get better. Financial literacy is actually at the core of our company culture. At the end of every year, I um, sit down with each member of uh, well, each employee and find out what their goals are for the next year. And by doing that, it allows me to help them plan ahead. So, um, for example, um, I had a dispatch rider who said his goal for the year was to buy his wife a shop. 
so she could become financially independent. And so we calculated his salary and I told him that, you know, we, we worked it out based on how much he's earning and how much the store is and how much he needs to put aside. And so what happened is I was taking out a certain amount of his salary and putting it into an account for him. So that way, when the time comes, he can easily purchase the, the, the store for his wife. Um, I do that because I believe that at the end of every year, we should be able to look back as a company and as individuals within the organization and say that we've achieved our goals. Um, the good thing about that is it also allows um, you know, us as a company to see how we can also help to subsidize the dreams and ambitions of our employees. And so they can use the money um, that they probably would have to you know, further achieve the goals for the following year. We don't tell them this obviously, but we just do that as a means to make sure that everybody knows that they're working towards something. We're all responsible towards you know our goals and even me as an individual as a creative director I do the same thing I have my goals I sometimes I share them with my employees and we all just calculate you know based on this how long will it take to achieve these goals and so yeah we do have a, a culture of saving um, at the group and we also believe that it's very important um, to do so sometimes it's difficult because you know in Nigeria you can wake up one morning and be told, oh, you know, your generator has uh, broken down and you need to cough up three million naira to buy a new one. And so sometimes um, it makes it a bit discouraging, uh, you know, when you have to take out money from your savings to purchase something that you didn't expect. But I guess that's why we also um, have a contingency plan for emergencies. The first time I made money from my business was when I had some turbans that I had made and uh, they just happened to be in my boots because I didn't have a store, I didn't have a factory, I didn't have any storage facilities, so I stored everything in the boot of my car. And I was at a party and a lady came up to me and said, oh, you were the woman that had this really nice turban on that I saw you um, with at a party, you know, a few weeks back. Um, and she said she really wanted to find out where I got it from. So I told her, I said, oh, I actually have some in my boot. Do you want to come and have a look? And then she said, yes. Yeah. So she followed me to my boot. She was so excited and she was grabbing everything. And um, she, you know, she, she took the container that I'd kept the turbans in and brought them into the party. And she said, oh, ladies, the, the lady that made this, the lady that wore this thing the other day, she's here, she has more. And so I actually ended up going back home with an empty container uh, which was really nice and very encouraging and I think for me that was my sign that um, there was a market for this and I should pursue it. What did I do with the money? Um, in all honesty I used the money to reproduce things that I had sold and um, also bought a sewing machine. The advice I'd give to anyone who is planning on uh, venturing into fashion um, would be you know that it takes a lot more to sustain a brand um, than creativity in order to be sustainable as a brand it's important for you to have an idea of structure and processes and ensure that you've built a brand on the solid foundation of structure and processes I would also advise that you get enough information about what the market wants. Sometimes we jump into something and we say, oh, you know, we like it, and so therefore we're going to do it, it's our passion. But our passions don't necessarily translate into earnings. And so to ensure that there's earning potential behind your passion, I always advise to do some market research. There are companies out there that, you know, can carry out the research for you, just so you can have an idea of your financial projections going forward. Um, and lastly, I would say the most important thing that has kept me going is actually my faith and uh, my relationship with God. So yeah, once you have all of those things um, ticked, I think you should be just fine. Thank you.